scripture reading today, God's Word, is Luke 12, 49 through 53. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and now I wish it was already kindled, but I have a baptism to go to. Go. And how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but the vision. From now on there will be five in one family, divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against the father, mother against the daughter, and daughter against the mother. Mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against the mother. Daughter-in-law against the mother. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Children's Church. Come on, girls. Thank you, Roma. Uh, girl, 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 girl. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity and freedom to come and worship you, Lord. We just pray that your spirit upon us today as we read your word. Lord, open up our hearts and minds to what words that Jesus is saying to us. To, he is saying to his disciples and he's saying to the world. Because he came to die for our sins to take our place so that no one would have to perish but we all could come alive. And we just thank you for his words. We thank you for what he did for us as obedience to the Father. We thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. We want to give us back a place where we can be in heaven, where we can be your children rather than facing the judgment that we all deserve. So we just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you've been here, you know that we've been going through Luke 12 and talking about that. And Luke 12 is kind of a tough passage. We started back in Luke 9, 51, where Jesus knew that his time had come and he set his face resolutely to Jerusalem. He knew that he didn't have that much time left. So he started giving these final instructions to his children, to his disciples, to those who said that they would come after and follow him. And we're to verse 49 and 53 now, and we've got some more tough teachings to look at. In chapter 11, Jesus gives his, gives his teachings to the disciples, and he gives several warnings to the Pharisees. Warnings of them to repent. So if you look back at chapter 11, you see all these woes. These woes weren't to people condemning them for what they've done. Those, these woes were, if you don't change the way that you're doing, your future is bleak. It's terrible. You need to change your way of thinking. And this was to the religious leaders at the time. And guess what? That still applies to this world today. Because many will say, Lord, Lord, and He will say, Depart from me, I did not know you. The only way that you will enter heaven is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because He was the only one who ever lived a worthy life, and He died in our place. So that we would not have to perish. That we could not accomplish these things because now He did it for us. So that He took upon all of our sins, all of our shame, and He defeated sin once and for all on the cross. And then in Luke 12, He tells for the first time that He'll be going away and that He will be returning. And He talks about the servants that He's put in charge. And that wicked servant when He returns, because that day is coming whether you're ready or not, that wicked servant will even actually be cut in half and exposed for what he really is. He's not a true servant at all. He was a hypocrite. Back in Luke 11, at the end of the chapter, it says, in verse 53 and 54, it says, When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and began to beseech him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. This was the religious leaders of the time. They prayed and out and wanted to kill Jesus. To get rid of him because of the things that he was saying. So when you hear people in this world today say, well, Jesus was just a good, good saint. He was a moral teacher. He, he did all these good things. No, he had people in an uproar that wanted to kill him. 
Because see, most people want a God that serves them rather than a God that we serve. And that's our problem. So chapter 12 started off in verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, I want you to remember what all was going on when we get up this point. Thousands of people, enough that they were trampling on each other. Jesus began to first to speak to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Why? Because there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. And there we go in Luke 12, talking about this day of judgment that will be coming up. <coughs> Jesus came once, and God offered salvation through him. Remember that he's talking to the Jewish nation also who would oppose him and would send him to the cross. But the Jewish nation is not the only one that sent him to the cross. We all sent Jesus to the cross because we're all guilty of sin. And we're all deserving of God's wrath for the wages that we have done. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But it is a gift that you have to accept. Jesus warns and warns and warns about hypocrisy, about those who call themselves servants who are not. He warns the crowd who just came to be fed and get their stomachs full that a day of reckoning is coming. There is a day when everything will be revealed. Nothing will be hidden. Everybody will have to pay for what they've done. But if you believe in Jesus then you're covered by the blood of Jesus. You wear His robe of righteousness. And when that day comes, you'll hear not guilty, my son, my daughter, you belong to me. Verse 49 of Luke 12 says, I have come to bring, or the King James Version says, uh, sin. It means to cast, to pour out, to thrust, to send down to strike or throw down fire on earth and how I wish it were already kindled. This is a Bible verse that you've got to read the whole passage of Luke to understand it. And you may have to study it a little further because what is Jesus saying here? I thought He came to bring peace on earth, right? That's what we hear in our Christmas carols. <laughs> peace and goodwill to men. Well, he's saying right here, I have come to bring fire on us. So maybe He's talking about the Holy Spirit rather than fire as it sounds like. But if you read Luke 12, it sounds more like He's talking about judgment fire. That's what he's talking about. And how I wish it were already kindled. What does that mean? How he wishes it was already burning. Or ablaze. So what is Jesus talking about here? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 1 and see if we think it's the Holy Spirit. Starting in the second part of verse 3, it says, He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. That's what we see as a constant theme in Luke, a constant theme in Matthew. The kingdom of God, because it's at hand. That's why you need to repent of your ways of thinking and follow after Jesus' words, His example, His teaching. Come and follow after Him. He'll make you fishers of men. On one occasion, verse 4, while He was eating with them, He gave them this command. We like to call them suggestions, but they're commands, aren't they? Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father promised which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, now, we read, Merle read about baptism. Is this the same thing? And we're talking about Holy Spirit here, which is, is talked about many times throughout the Bible as, about in the Bible as fire. So could Jesus be talking about what He's wanting to come down from heaven and how He wishes it was already kindled? Is it the Spirit? So let's read on in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So the Spirit is definitely talked about about fire, but, but is that what He's talking about here in Luke chapter 12? Maybe. Verse 50 said in Luke 12, But I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint? That means I am pressed or oppressed. I'm suffering from. I'm distressed. I'm afflicted. I'm held fast to. I 
have a baptism to undergo and it is stressing me out. But I am under it until it is completed. Now here, as many Bible scholars stuff don't seem to differ, they say that that baptism is the cross that he's going to face, Calvary. But we still don't know what that fire is before because we like to sugarcoat it and talk about God as love. But see, we also have to talk about God as a just God who will bring judgment. So when we hear someone say, how could a loving God, you can say, how can a loving God not? Because He gave you every chance to listen to Jesus' words. And if you read back from Luke 9, 51 to the point we're at now, this fits. Jesus is warning them, there is a day coming. Be ready for that day. You don't know when it's going to come or what hour. The only reasonable thing for you to do is to follow after me completely. To be that good, wise, and faithful servant so that you know on that day, without a shadow of a doubt, that you're going to be found not guilty. Anything else, where are you going to be come that day? <clears throat> Turn to Matthew, or we'll look at Matthew. Or excuse me, Mark. Chapter 10, verse 35 through 38. Let's see if we can figure out more about this baptism. Verse 35 says, Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Sounds like we should get a little criticism there or reprimand, doesn't it? But he doesn't do that. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Because see, the Father wants to give you so richly. It just depends on what you want, your motives. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Not Alan's will and Alan's kingdom but my Father in heaven. They replied, Let us sit at your right hand, one at your right and the other at your left when you're in glory. That's not in this world. That's in the world to come. They're talking about future rewards that we talked about in heaven. So that we realize that heaven is going to be a fabulous place, but it is so sad that some Christian says, Well, I don't really care about these things. All I care about is I get to heaven. No, you should strive for your Father in heaven to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you did not waste this life. Read all through the New Testament and you'll see where Jesus, where Paul, where Peter, where John talk about rewards in heaven. Jesus answers in verse 38, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or the portion that God has given me? No, you can't. You can't do that. You can't die for your sins in this earth. You can't live a righteous, holy life. You cannot come to God. <coughs> so He came to you through me. You can't drink the cup that I'm going to drink that was a portion of me from God. Can you then or, or be baptized with the baptized I am ba with the bat with the baptism I am baptized with. Sorry for being tongue tied. Can you? Because, see, that baptism means that I am going to totally take upon my shoulders, Jesus Christ is, the complete sins of every human being forever. This payment is going to be payment in full for everyone who previously died, who ever was alive then, who would come to live in the future. This baptism that Jesus went was total immersion, totally took up everything He had as a human being and as God and was totally accepted by God the Father as being complete. You have nothing to worry about if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You are a child of God. Nothing to worry about. So when the devil comes and says, oh, you've committed sins and you're not worthy. No, you're not worthy, but you're covered by the blood of the Lamb, aren't you? Flee from me, devil. And he will flee from you. these bigger sins. So this baptism is the cross. Jesus came to die for our sins. That's His purpose. He came. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. So He knew what was going to happen, but He also had to face it as a man. And facing it as a man was a terrible thing because of what He was going to go through. The shame, the betrayal, the pain, the suffering. But what was even more is that He was God. And He was going to be separated for the first time from God the Father because He had to be completely separated from God because of his sin. Because God had to turn his back on the sin. Which means he had to turn his back on his son. Can you imagine that? I mean the pain that he suffered as a man is one thing. But the pain he suffered as God for you and I 
is incredible. That my God would do that for me, that His love is that great, so that none should perish, no, not one. He was so distressed that a medical condition we know now called hematohydrosis. I think I got it out right. We know what that means now. He sweated drops of blood. He had so much anxiety that his blood vessels expanded. And when they contracted again, when they eased, blood vessels burst and went into his sweat and sweated out drops of blood. But when you read the Bible, then you don't understand it. See, we have much more knowledge now. We understand this as a medical condition that happens in times of extreme duress. So the scriptures make sense now, don't they, when we get more knowledge. But we try to look at our own knowledge and make things right. But man's knowledge, knowledge is foolishness to God, is it not? The ways of the Lord are right and true. Jesus longed for that fire to be thrown down from heaven. So what is that fire? In fact, He wishes it was already ablaze. But first He must face the cross. So is that fire the Holy Spirit or is that fire judgment? In Acts 2.2 it said, Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came or came to pass. The Spirit was not thrown down from heaven. The word used there was came from heaven. It has a total different meaning in Greek. The Spirit came down by His own accord to earth. It was not thrown down to us. You have to look at those verbs. You have to look at the contents of it. So I don't really think that this fire here that Luke is describing is the Holy Spirit in this case. So let's go look at John the Baptist's words back in Luke chapter 3. John said to the crowds, this is starting in verse 7. John said to the crowds that were coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! It wasn't nice about it, was he? Who warned you to flee from the coming, what? Wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Change your mind and let me see your works of it. Not just change your mind. You see, we say whoever believes in Jesus Christ. That word believe means total trust, total commitment. Jesus said, unless you're like a little child, you will not come and enter the kingdom of heaven. Because see, a little child has total trust in their dad. They don't know that their dad's lost their job and we don't know where our next meal's coming from. They don't know that the things are going on in the world around them and we don't know if we'll even have freedom or anything else. They know that my daddy right here will take care of everything because they have that faith like a little child. They trust in him completely. And that's what the word believes means. For whoever believes in him, that we have that total trust and faith so in verse 8, And do not say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. Nothing else is going to work. For I tell you that out of these stones God could raise up children of Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Judgment is coming. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into what? The fire. Judgment. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share them with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Sounds kind of like Jesus' teaching on feed my enemy, doesn't he? Or if my enemy takes my coat, give him my shirt also. Hmm. These things tie together, don't they? <clears throat> Even tax collectors came to be baptized, the worst of the worst. Teacher, they asked the tax collectors, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked, what should we do? He replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely, but be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all. He told them clearly, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now there's a key word in here, and. Two things, the Holy Spirit and judgment fire. So in Luke, I don't care what other commentators say, and I don't say that very often. You can read through that. This, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about what's talked about in the whole context of the passage. Judgment is coming. 
That fire will prove if your works are worthy and true, if your faith is worthy and true, or you will face everlasting judgment. Please repent. Woe to you. Change your ways of thinking. I want everyone to come to faith through me, Jesus Christ. And how I wish it were already done so that sin would be stamped out once and for all. So that those who believe, truly believe, will spend an eternity in heaven. If you're having a surgery, you know you have cancer in your body. Don't you wish it were already completed and it was over? But see, we still got to go through this because we're part of God's plan. We are a light to this world. We are salt to the earth. We are the ones that should live a life worthy so that others will see that, see our joy, our hope, our faith, and want to know more about Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Genesis 19.24 says, Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord of the heavens. So you see it again. The pattern's there, and I'm going to give you some more Old Testament Scripture in a little bit to show you the pattern of what Jesus is saying. So Jesus said in Luke 12, 49, I have come to bring judgment fire on earth, and how I wish it were already burning so that we could have a completion to this, so that you could spend an eternity in heaven. Revelation 21 says, in verse 1 through 5, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Don't you want that to come? See, that's after the surgery when the cancer's all gone and got rid of, right? Don't you long for that and wish it were already here? But see, we've got to go through Revelation 20 first before we get there. Jesus had to tell us that we needed to repent of our ways. The cross was coming. He would be gone, but He would be returning. And we've got this time in between, but we don't know how long that is. So we can't wait till the last minute. We need to repent now. We need to live our life worthy now because we don't know how long we have, whether it's death or whether it's when Jesus returns. And when He returns, there won't be any do-overs. There won't be any second chances. In Revelation 20, verse 7 through 15, this is what has to happen before what we read in Revelation 21. When the thousand years are over, Satan will re be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand of the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people. See, we have hope in everything though, right? The city he loves. But fire came down from heaven, judgment fire, and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who, who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in these books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of the fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. That's what people have to look forward to if they don't accept what Jesus Christ did if they don't repent of their ways and turn from their ways of thinking, that I've got plenty of time to make this decision. That, oh, there are plenty of ways to, to heaven. Oh, it really doesn't matter anyway. God is a loving God. How could He ever condemn anyone to hell? These are all lies from Satan. Jesus says it clearly. I am the way. 
the life, the truth, and the life. I knew I had to think. That's why I paused. <laughs> and no one comes to the Father but through me. These things happen so that we have this glorious place in heaven so that we can know without any doubt that that's where our home belongs. So again, if you're that cancer patient and you get through cancer, you're going to be promoting this, saying, oh, this, this is great. I, I've, I have fought through this cancer and I'm a survivor. Aren't you going to do the same for the Lord? I did nothing, but because of His mercy and grace, He saved me because of what Jesus Christ did. Let me tell you about Him. Because I'm a survivor because of what God did for me. And here's what God has in plan for me. Judgment fire will come. That's what Jesus has said. So be ready. That's what He's saying all through this part of Luke. I told you we'd look at some more Old Testament passages. These are some prophecies that were foretold. Isaiah 30, verse 27 and verse 30. See, the name of the Lord comes from afar with burning anger and dense clouds of smoke. His lips are full of wrath and His tongue is a consuming fire. The Lord will cause people to hear His majestic voice and will make them see His arm coming down with raging anger and consuming fire, with cloudbursts, thunder, and hail. And in the last chapter of Isaiah, verse 66, chapter 66, verse 16, he writes, For the, with fire and his sword the Lord will execute judgment on all people, and many will be slain by the Lord. Judgment has to be a part of it. But no one has to face it if they know Jesus Christ. So we've got the obligation, the privilege, the joy to tell others. And we've got to live a life accordingly or we'll be called hypocrites, won't we? Because we might be wearing a mask. And Jesus warned against that time after time. Sometimes you get caught up on the stage and you think you're part of the play. But see, take the mask off. Let Jesus expose you and see what's really true in your heart. Because if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Joel had this to write. In Joel chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. Before them, fire devours. Behind them, a flame blazes. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. Two outcomes. Jesus came first not to judge the world. John 3, 17 tells us that. But to, to give us an opportunity to accept Him. To bring righteousness, His righteousness. But there is a time coming when there will be judgment. And see that day, one of two things. You can look forward to it because you know you're covered. Your sins are forgiven. Or you should fear and tremble and make yourself right. Jesus is saying you have the opportunity. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. Completely burned up. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for, who, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. So going back to Luke, let's read it again. Verses 12, chapter 12, verse 49 through 51. See if it has a new meaning to you. I have come to bring fire on the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo. And what constraint I am under until it's completed. Do you think that I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. 
He's telling them plainly because they expected, especially in that time, that Jesus would come as their Messiah and reign and they would get the benefits of that. But He came to offer salvation, not to reign at this time. He's going to reign later when He comes back and judges. That day is inevitable. But like I said, do we have a contradiction here? I said it before. Luke wrote earlier, peace to all men, right? Luke chapter 2, verse 14, when he starts his letter off pretty much. King James Version says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Isn't that what you hear? That sounds like all men to me. Well, I'm not going to get into depth in it because it's another story, but there's a little, in the King James Version, one little character that's missing that creates possessiveness. Which some of the other translations like the NIV say, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those whom, on whom His favor rests. One little character that made it possessive, meaning that yes, peace is here for those who believe, who trust in my name, who come and follow after me. Maybe you don't believe that one. Maybe you say, ah, oh, I like King James Version and I'm sticking with that period. Well, that's fine. You can stick with that too. Because still, there's still the concept of peace is available to all men, but they still have to accept it. Either way works, right? So there's no contradiction in Scripture here whatsoever. You can't say, oh, I don't like these verses and cast them out and not talk about it because Judgment Day is going to happen. So in Luke 12, verse 51 to 53, it says, Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, I'm going to give you an example. There will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Pretty much covers the basis, don't he? Now wait a minute. The Old Testament teaches about that we should not have any division in our homes, that children should obey their parents, that husbands should love their wives, all these things, right? Is this a contradiction in Scripture? Let's throw it out. No, it's not. It's saying that there will be division because you have to decide for yourself if you're going to accept my gift and what you're going to do with it. If you're going to truly follow after me or not, or whether you're playing a game and you've got a mask on. Not everyone in your family might do that. So there's going to be division. And oh, how that means that you need to be faithful and true and wise because of that. Because they're going to see whether your faith is true or not or whether they think you're wearing a mask and you go to church on Sunday as a poser or whatever it is. Or because you believe a lie and you think that just going to church will get you saved. The only thing that's going to get you saved is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you put your total trust and confidence in God who sent His Son and you know that what He did sets you free totally. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. So He gives the example in that day. Here's what's going to happen. It has to happen before we can get to eternity. Judgment will be coming. So let's read on. In verse 54, He said to the crowd, so now He's turning His attention, not to just those who would follow Him, but to everyone, because salvation is to everyone, right? To anyone who believes. When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say it's going to be hot, and it is. Well, to the south is deserts. When the wind comes out of that, it's hot. It doesn't change. We can kind of tell our weather patterns here. But you can really tell them in Israel. When it comes from the east, is that what it says? West, I think where I'm at there. It comes off the Mediterranean. And guess what? Clouds are blowing in with moisture. It doesn't change. They'll say it on the radio today. Listen to a report from... Israel, and, and then if they say the winds are coming in from this direction, this is what's going to happen. So he's saying, you guys can be weather meteorologists, and we see today we still can't be that, right? Because you look at the forecast daily. But if you can see the signs that were the heavens that would declare the glory of God in the first place, you can't see all the mighty miracles and things that I've done to say that I came from God. And I've told you I not only came from God, 
But I am the promised Messiah. I am God's Son. You want to believe it's blasphemy, but I've given you every proof in the world. You can look at the weather and make forecasts, but you can't see what I've done. Hypocrites. Isn't that the next word? That's what we started off this chapter with. That's why I read it to you again. You're fooling yourself. You're wearing a mask. You think you know these things because you have all this wisdom, but it's not going to save you. There's a day coming. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourself what is right? Here's where it helps to know what these words mean. That right, that same Greek word, can be translated as righteousness. Can be translated as justified. How is it that you don't know in your hearts what it takes to be set right with God? Not with man, but with God. Because God is who you owe your life debt to because you, that's who you sinned against, correct? So that's all that matters in all this. I'm su he's summing up this chapter here, and the chapter's got a good break in it where it ends because he's summing all this up saying, you need to be ready. There's a day of judgment coming, and you're going to meet the ultimate judge of all. Where do you stand with him? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So verse 58 and 59 conclude the chapter. What do they say? It says, As you're going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled on the way. Or your adversary may drag you off to the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid every last penny. Now you notice that I tell you in there again. That means you're not going to believe this, you're not going to want to hear it, you may think your, your ways of thinking teach something else, like how could a good loving God throw someone in hell? But I'm telling you this so you understand this. You will not get out until you have paid every last penny. Now let me ask you about your riches, your possessions. On that day of judgment, can you pay your debt? For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. On that day, there is no way you're going to pay yourself out of your penalty for sin. Period. So we could break this other apart and say, well, what does he mean here? Who's the adversary? Blah, blah, blah. Jesus is simply saying, why don't you make sure on your way to see the judge that you settle out of court while you still can? Because when you get there, you're going to be found guilty if you haven't settled out of court. I'm here now. You can see the weather. You can see the things that's going on. I am the Messiah who was prophesied about. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep. Those who hear my voice and follow after me, those are my true sheep. Those who love me will obey me. Those who want to come and follow after me will forsake all and follow after me, the Master and the Teacher. Jesus said, why do you call me Master and Lord, Master and Teacher? Because that's what I am. But if you don't follow after me, then you might want to examine yourself and see if you have a mask on. Because that day that comes, read all through Luke again, go home, do that your homework through Luke 12. That day, that mask will be taken off. No matter if you said, Lord, Lord, we did mighty works in your name. No matter what the reason that you have is, you will either be found guilty or not guilty. But you have time to settle right now outside of court while you're still breathing. You might not have tomorrow, but you have right this second to make things right with God. Maybe He's your Savior and not your Lord. You can do that right now too. You can change your way of thinking. Settle outside of court, please. If you look in your bulletins, I think it's from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, right? It says, this is your final answer. Is that what it's from? Okay, make sure I got the right thing so I'm not... So I'm not saying the wrong thing and somebody get a hold of me. Okay, that show's called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or, or whatever. Is that right? Yeah. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Yeah, we want to be a millionaire. It's not who does not want to be a millionaire, right? Who would want to go do that? 
Who wants to spend an eternity with God in heaven? Who wants to go to that other place? Okay, so we're over here, right? So we have a chance right now. We can call our lifeline. We can do what are the other things you can do? Phone a friend. Phone a friend. Get a 50-50 where they take two choices out. That's a good one. That's a real good one. Okay. We got all this chance to do that now because we're still breathing. Holy Spirit's still coming to us, asking us, will you believe? Will you repent of your ways? Will you believe in Jesus? Because when you say, this is my final answer, then you're going to have to face judgment. So Jesus says, please, 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 please. You see the weather, everything else. Make it right before that day comes. Romans 3, 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But, complete reversal, one or the other. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 starting verse 3, says, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love, of all, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. These are the things we should be seeing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. We should see this in any situation. All of this is evidence that God's judgment is right because of how you live, that you can see Christ Jesus in you. <clears throat> and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble for those who trouble you and give relief to, to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in a blazing fire with His powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Oh, how we need to have a heart that desperately tells others of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have. Oh, how we need to know that what we have is true hope, that we're not wearing a mask. So Jesus is closing out this and says, examine yourselves. Please, please, that's why I came to die. To give you the opportunity to repent, to accept me before judgment. So I just hope and pray that you'll settle things today. I've got a video that we're going to play to close instead of a song. I'll lead us in prayer and then Steve will play the video. Father, we thank you so much for your love that you would go out of your way to redeem us back. <laughs> we thank you so much, Father. We thank you so much. And we give you the glory and honor that you deserve. In Jesus' name.